Hey, AP Calculus students, Mr. Record here. We're going to be taking a look at our very first example from a new topic, 5.6 in the CED, which is really entitled The Test for Concavity. And we're going to talk about uh, a new feature of a graph at this point and talk about how we can analyze functions to see if they display this certain feature. So let's go ahead and take a look uh, at some preliminary information before we work through example one part A. So concavity, nope, it's not something that your dentist tells you that you have with a problem with your teeth. This is just a little bit different and I'm going to go ahead and start by displaying a very interesting graph uh, f of x equal 1 divided by x minus 1. So we have that curve sketched here. And you'll note that in the box, I jump right to it and say, hey, f of x, he's concave downward on the interval negative infinity to positive 1. And he's concave upward on the infinity 1 to 0. Now, you can sometimes think about concavity as being a bowl that holds water or spills water. If we think of a bowl that's shaped like that, that's obviously a bowl that could contain water within it. But if a bowl is upside down, then it's pretty clear that that water is not going to stay there very long and it's going to spill right out. Well, sometimes concavity is a little bit more subtle. And it's not so obvious, but hopefully we can get a little bit more comfortable with recognizing shapes that are concave down, like this leftward one, versus shapes that are concave up. But regardless, it's not going to be good enough to state that a graph's concave up because it looks like a cup, or it's down because it looks like a frown. It's going to require a little bit more insight mathematically. And that's what we have here in our orange box as the definition of concavity. And it says, let f be differentiable on an open interval, i. The graph of f is considered concave upward on i if f prime is increasing. So let's stop right there a moment. Let's take a look at the part of this graph that it is indeed concave up, which is the right branch. And if I were to take a look at, let's say, three different tangent line locations. So I'm just going to randomly put three points in here. I'm going to indicate them with my red, green, and purple line segments. Then you can see that the slope of each of these is certainly negative. However, the slope is increasing. Yes, I'm negative, but super big. Here I'm negative, but maybe not so big. In fact, I might be kind of close to negative 1. And in this purple line, I'm negative, but pretty small, like some kind of a fraction. So we can say that we are definitely increasing with our f prime values. And that's a really good way to indicate concave upwardness. But that can, be get, that can get very difficult to analyze. So what I like to tell my students is, hey, if f prime is increasing, Think about how that impacts the derivative of f prime. And that just simply means that the second derivative is positive. If f increases, isn't f prime positive? So why wouldn't f double prime be positive in order for f prime to increase? And if we jump down to our green box, that is exactly what we see in the first criteria for the test for concavity. If f is a function whose second derivative exists on an open interval a to b, if the second derivative is positive for all x on that open interval, the graph of f is concave upward on the open interval. We can flip that around to talk about concave downwardness. If I go back to my graph of the concave down branch and I draw in just some random segments that are tangent to the curve like such, I can see as I go from this powder blue to this gray to this black, I'm certainly getting less and less. I'm decreasing. My, my slope of those tangent lines is becoming a much smaller number as I move throughout. And that's why we say f prime is decreasing, which is the same as f double prime being less than zero. And that is indeed what is indicated in criteria two. Now, another way to think about this and it works for me, but we'll see if you guys like this or not, is that think about positive as being like the people in your life. Positive people in your life generally are very up. They have a kind of an optimistic viewpoint on life, and 
their graphs look like this because they smile all the time. You're a positive person. But the negative people in our lives sometimes bring us down, right? They're kind of downers, and they kind of tend to frown a lot, concave down. Maybe that'll help you remember. A couple of other criteria we have here, uh, which are really pretty basic and straightforward. It's possible that you've talked about points of inflection in other courses, but the idea of a point of inflection is just simply an ordered pair where a graph changes concavity. So if you have a graph that changes from concave up to concave down, something like that, then that point right there is a point of inflection. It can also change from concave down to concave up just as easily. And the theorem about a, con, a point of inflection is simply going to state that if you've got a, a CF of C that is a point of inflection, then one of two things is going to be true. The second derivative of that value is going to be equal to zero, or that function is not going to have a derivative at that value of C. So it's very much in tune with our minimum and maximum theorem that says a point of uh, minimum or maximum has to be a critical point. So that gives us just enough ammunition to be dangerous. So let's go ahead and take a look at our first example here in one part A. The directions say state the open intervals on which each graph is concave upward or downward and state any points of inflection. On a difficulty scale, this one's certainly a little bit lower on the rung. I would probably classify this as a 2 or a 3 in level of difficulty. Uh, and it's simply because it's a polynomial function and therefore it doesn't really have any tricks to its derivative. So the derivative that we're going to take f prime is going to look a little something like this 4x cubed minus 12x squared. Now, because we're dealing with the test for concavity, that means that we are going to bypass this first derivative. Think about driving your car through a little town. We're not going to stop for gas. We're not going to stop for a Slurpee, a big gulp, or anything like that. We're just going to move right through that town to get to our other destination, which happens to be second derivativeville. We want to take the second derivative. And so when we do that, 12x squared minus 24x is what we're going to get. Now this is going to start to look familiar. You're going to go through some processes that are going to remind you very much of some of the former work you've done in this unit. You're going to figure out when does that second derivative equal zero? When does that second derivative be undefined? Because after all, we've just determined that points of inflection can only happen at those two places. Now it's pretty clear that our function our second derivative of the function can't be undefined because it's a polynomial. Now that second derivative can equal 0 and we're going to factor out a 12x to make our lives a little bit easier. It leaves us with x minus 2 equals 0 and that will give us x equals 0 and x equal 2. Now note, technically, by definition, technically x equals 0 and 2 are not critical numbers. We don't really refer to them as such. And I've had many conversations with teachers all over the country, all over the world, about whether or not this is really true. I go, what do you call the results of when your second derivative equals zero? And some say, yeah, I know. I don't call them critical points or critical numbers because really those just belong to the first derivative. So maybe they're second derivative critical values. I'm not so sure if I like that but I could get by with it. I, I know a lot of teachers that call them potential points of inflection, and I think that's okay. But I think sometimes as teachers, we really need to be careful and stay away from calling these critical points because we don't want to confuse them with the results from the first derivative set equal to zero or undefined. Okay, so for now, I might call them potential points of inflection. So what you're going to do at this stage is go back to your idea of setting up a number line. And on this number line, you're going to know that we have 0 and 2 that lie upon it. And we know that above this number line, we could figure out what is the sign of f double prime. And then that's going to tell us what is the behavior of f. Now with that 
in mind, let's go ahead and test some values. Between negative infinity and zero, negative one is about as good as anything. So we're going to test that guy, and we're going to make sure that we test it in the right spot. We are finding the sine of f double prime, so that's where I want to go. So sometimes it's nice to highlight things. Keep in mind, though, you cannot use a highlighter on the AP exam, so you want to wean yourself from doing that if you have a habit uh, as you get late into the spring semester. Let's go ahead and plug negative 1 in for our x. So we'd have 12 times negative 1 squared minus 24 times negative 1. So this is going to give us 12 plus 24, which is pretty clearly positive. So what is the behavior of our function on that interval? Well, it's not increasing. That would be the behavior based on the first derivative analysis. The behavior here is concave upward. And we're just going to abbreviate that as con up. Between 0 and 2, we can pick a number between. 1 is as good as any. We place 1 in the position of our x. So we'd have 12 times 1 squared minus 24 times 1. And that's going to be negative 12. I see that now. And I'm more concerned whether it's positive or negative. So negative is our result. And our behavior is con down. And so you just keep doing this over and over for as many intervals as we have. If you plug in 3, this one's going to keep us a little bit occupied because we've got a little larger number here. I believe that 12 times 9 is 108. Subtract 72. That's good enough for me. 36 is that result. We're going to say that we're positive in our second derivative, and thus we're con up. Now, the issue that we have here is that, unfortunately, a number line is typically typically not going to be scored on the AP exam. So we're going to want to write up our findings uh, a little bit more with a narrative. And it says, first of all, determine the open intervals on which the graph is con up or con down. So we'll say that, OK, f of x is con up. We'll start with that. Doesn't matter which. And we know that. Uh, our concavity upwardness is going to appear on two different intervals, one of which is negative infinity to zero. <clears throat> the other one is on two to infinity. I would prefer that my students use open interval notation uh, when you define your intervals of concavity. Um, I tend to like to use closed interval notation for increasing and decreasing. Uh, the College Board doesn't really get in the middle of that fight, and they'll accept either notation on those increasing, decreasing intervals. Uh, let's stick with these open intervals for the course of our video series on concavity, though. And we know that this concavity is going to exist on these intervals because, well, it's because our second derivative turns out to be positive on and then you can either list the intervals again by name. Maybe I can just refer to them as those intervals. I think that's pretty clear in this particular problem. Now we'll do the same thing when we mention f of x being concave downward. We'll abbreviate con down. It turns out that there's only one interval of concavity that's downward, and that's on the open interval 0 to 2. And the reasoning is because f double prime of x is less than 0 on that interval. And i tell you what, it's probably quicker just to list the interval by name than to write the words that interval. We have to finish up by asking or stating where is the point of inflection. You can always abbreviate points of inflection with the uh, acronym POI. It's done all the time on the AP exam. And we'll state where those occur. Those are going to be locations. I'm not concerned about you giving me the ordered pair. So we can just simply say at x equals 0 and x equal 2. The reason because f double prime does something very important there. Notice that it changes signs. And so that's going to typically be our best explanation. f double prime changes signs at x equals 0 and x equal, zero, uh, x equal 2. Now, you want to stay away from some other explanations because there's some things that probably aren't going to work well. I would not want to say that we have these POIs because 
F changes from concave up to down or down to up, or F changes concavity. That's kind of defining what a point of inflection is. You're being asked to determine where they are and thus why. So always reference the fact that your second derivative changes signs when you're given information like this. If we wanted to take a moment to sketch the graph of x to the fourth minus 4x cubed, we would find out that our findings are corroborated by the, the, the look of that graph. Let's take a look at that on the calculator. So here we are. I have taken the liberty to sketch this graph, f of x equal x to the fourth minus 4x cubed on my ti inspire. Notice I had to modify my viewing window so that I could see this minimum point, which interestingly enough, didn't think about calculating the minimum of this graph, but it is indeed down there, pretty pretty low. But I wanted to kind of show you a feature of the TI Inspire that allows you to look for a point of inflection. If you go into the menu and analyze graph feature, there is an option called inflection. If we select option five there, we're just going to have to scan our graph and choose a spot that seems to be to the left of where our first point of inflection might occur. So if I click maybe to the left of the entire graph here, scan over. When it picks up a point of inflection, boom, it's going to tell me. And it turns out that this is at the point zero, zero. I was more concerned about the x value being zero as a POI, and it certainly was. If we go back into menu, analyze graph, choose option five, and continue our work, we'll find out that the next point of inflection does indeed occur when x is two. And so you can see the concavity switches from an upward to a downward, and very subtly at this point, we're back to concave up throughout the duration of the graph. I hope this helps a little bit in understanding uh, the idea of the test for concavity. I, I do invite you to take a look at the next two problems uh, in the notes packet. I will have some videos made for both of those, but I am going to warn you they are a little bit more challenging. I typically don't cover those in my class, and um, I ask that my students take it upon themselves to practice with those if they feel that their derivative taking skills are a little bit uh, deficient. So definitely check out example 1b and 1c when you got a chance to see how you can handle this process with slightly more complicated functions. Anyway, we thank you for joining. We'll see you next time.